nuclear war, for decades considered the ultimate and final war, and therefore its own deterrent. But is it? Tonight we'll examine an announced shift in U.S. nuclear strategy, and we'll discuss that change with Defense Secretary Harold Brown. And on day 285 of the hostage crisis, the New York Times reports that Iran's internal security chief is believed to have been in Washington shortly before an Iranian exile leader was shot last month. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from New York. Good evening, or rather good morning. There was an important defense policy victory for President Carter at the just-ended Democratic National Convention. The delegates voted down a move backed by Senator Kennedy to repudiate the president's MX missile program. That victory is important for Mr. Carter in more ways than one because development of the MX is one of a series of factors that has led to a significant shift in U.S. nuclear strategy. The change in effect rejects the traditional view that nuclear war is impossible as long as each side is capable of almost total destruction of the other. The new U.S. strategy for nuclear war is our topic tonight. But in order to understand it, let's first take a look at the strategy it modifies. Here now is part of a report we presented back in 1979 that illustrates what would have happened in the event of a Soviet nuclear attack. What you're about to see is a war game, a scenario, one very simplified rendition of the war that almost everyone assumes will never happen. X-ray, Zulu, five, Zulu. Without any advance warning, the Soviet Union launches a massive nuclear strike against the United States. The Soviets fire roughly half of their 1,400 land-based missiles. Within seconds of launch, U.S. satellites have detected the missile plumes. Infrared sensors pick up the information, which is flashed back instantly to NORAD. Total missiles fired, 724. They've been out of their silos for 30 seconds. TTG, time to go before they hit their first targets in North America, less than 24 minutes. Inside the Combat Operations Center, the alert goes out to the Commanders-in-Chief of NORAD and the Strategic Air Command, SAC. I say again, Charlie, 7, 7, November. In Washington, the Secretaries of State and Defense are on the line within seconds, as are the Joint Chiefs and heads of the various intelligence agencies. Yes. The Secretary of Defense will be the one to call the President and the Prime Minister of Canada. Yes. Several helicopters are ordered to the White House. Time to go, 23 minutes. The order to fire land and submarine-based missiles and to target strategic bombers, that can only come from the President. But the bombers, tankers, command and control aircraft, as many as are on 24-hour ground alert, they have to be launched immediately. That order comes from SAC. Time to go. 22 minutes. The Secretary of Defense asks NORAD for a confidence evaluation. Are these definitely Soviet missiles targeted for the United States? There have been false alarms in the past. The word comes back immediately. Confidence level high. It's still too early, though, to predict precise targets. The Defense Secretary informs the President. Both of them, together with other members of the National Command Authority, will leave immediately for Andrews Air Force Base. The helicopter flight takes slightly more than eight minutes minutes. The president wants to know about projected targets. Ballistic missile early warning systems in England, Alaska, and Greenland have been tracking the Soviet missiles through separation and have now computed the impact points of more than 3,000 separate warheads. Time to go. 14 minutes. More than 2,000 of the warheads are targeted for North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Arizona, Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, the sites of all U.S. missile silos. About 300 warheads are targeted against 35 strategic air command bases, command and control centers across the country, with special concentration on NORAD, radar installations, communication centers, submarine bases. More than 900 additional high-yield warheads are headed for high-density population and industrial centers. New York, Chicago, Detroit, San Francisco, and approximately 200 other cities. Time to go. Ten minutes. 
Members of the National Command Authority, led by the President, board a refitted 747, NECAP, the National Emergency Airborne Command Post. The President directs a last desperate question at the Commander-in-Chief of NORAD. Is there any chance of a mistake? None. Time to go. Eight minutes. NECAP is airborne. The President's advisors are unanimous. Counter-strike. The President's orders are flashed in code and by voice command to SAC headquarters and to underground launch command and control centers scattered throughout our missile fields. There is one such control center for each 10 silos. Okay, launch action 07. It's on 7, sir. Initiate. Time to go. Three minutes. Both Third men keys. must agree to the launch. Both keys must be turned Three, and turned two, within two seconds one. of one another. Mark. Okay, we can go to the launch report. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven missile aways. Time to go. One minute. The last B-52 is to make it off the ground as screaming off the runway at 12 second intervals. For most of the bomber fleet, though, there won't be enough time for takeoff. Time to go. None. Within a total period of six minutes, over 3,000 warheads impact across the United States. A cluster of three warheads from an SS-9 missile lands near the White House, killing everyone within a half-mile radius. Approximately 600 U.S. land-based ICBMs and about 150 submarine-launched ballistic missiles have now been fired at the Soviet Union. Within the next 25 minutes, roughly 2,800 warheads will impact. They will have been targeted against remaining Soviet missile silos, nuclear storage sites, command and control centers, submarine bases, airfields, and a number of other high-priority military sites. They will also have been targeted against Moscow and Leningrad and Murmansk and Kiev and more than 200 other Soviet cities. Within 11 hours, the first of fewer than 100 B-52 bombers will slip under what is left of Soviet radar. They will be flying slightly more than 300 miles an hour at an altitude of less than 100 feet. Submerged, immobile, undetectable, a number of Poseidon and Polaris submarines whose missiles have not yet been fired. They are understanding orders to wait a month, three months, five months, before launching their missiles against Soviet cities as yet untouched. In a classified study, the National Security Council estimated casualties from a scenario similar to this one. American dead, about 140 million. Soviet dead, 113 million. 30 to 50 million more on each side would suffer serious injuries or high radiation doses. There is, as yet, no accurate way of calculating all the long-term effects of an all-out nuclear exchange. To repeat, that was, of course, a simulated scenario. Now the American government's view on nuclear war has shifted, and that scenario may very well no longer apply. In a moment, we'll look at the new U.S. strategy, and we'll discuss it with Defense Secretary Harold Brown. The big change in American nuclear strategy is a new emphasis on military targets and the ability to hit them with pinpoint accuracy. Opponents of the new strategy charge that its basic assumption that limited nuclear war is a possibility in itself increases the chances that such a war could take place and might swiftly turn into a total holocaust. But as Pentagon correspondent John McQuethy reports, the change in view is largely in response to the Soviet Union. Two factors have forced America's military planners to rewrite the guidelines for how this country would fight a nuclear war. One, the Russians have drawn to a position of parity with the U.S. in strategic nuclear arms. Two, U.S. intelligence sources have noted that the Soviets are prepared to fight a limited nuclear war, not the all-out exchange that for so many years was envisioned by American planners. Neither of these factors are new. They caused a major revision in targeting doctrine in 1970 
73 and 74. But what's ironic about the seven-year-old doctrine is that the U.S. still doesn't have the weapons to carry it out and probably won't for the next six to ten years. What's changed is that our leaders now believe the U.S. could fight a nuclear war, a limited one that could go on for months or years without the massive exchange of atomic missiles. President Carter's options now are theoretically far broader. He can order near total destruction of the Soviet Union, including population centers. Or he could call for a limited, almost surgical missile firing designed only to paralyze the government in Moscow, or to destroy a major naval base in Murmansk, or a key industrial city such as Minsk. Any of these options, or all of them. The problem, America does not have the three things it needs to bring the new strategy into operation. Sufficient accuracy of its missiles, the MX would solve this problem, but it won't be in operation for six to nine years. The ability to rapidly change targets of its missiles once the U.S. has been hit by a nuclear attack, and adequate, survivable command centers that could be linked to all U.S. missiles that remained after an attack. With an eye to these problems, the Pentagon is revising plans to ensure that emergency communications in this country will survive a limited nuclear attack. An effort is also underway to harden existing wartime military command posts against nuclear aggression. There likely will be far greater reliance on the flying command posts since they could escape hits by Russian intercontinental missiles. And finally, plans are being revised to make sure an adequate skeleton government could survive survive a Soviet attack. John McWethy, ABC News, Washington. Earlier tonight, we talked about the new policy with Defense Secretary Harold Brown here in New York. Mr. Secretary, the implication of Jack McWethy, uh, McWethy's part was that you really can't do it yet because you don't have the hardware. How do you respond to that? It depends on what it is, Ted. The, uh, the uh, uh, nuclear strategy of the United States is based fundamentally on the idea that a nuclear war can't really be won by either side. Uh, we are convinced of that. Uh, it is not clear that the Soviets are convinced of it. Is it your impression that the Soviets believe that there could be such a thing as a limited nuclear war? And more to the point, do you believe it? Uh, the Soviet military writers in recent years have certainly indicated in some of their writings that they believe there can be a protracted nuclear war. Uh, there is also some indication that they believe that the damage to themselves can be limited. Uh, the U.S. in its force structure and posture and in its nuclear doctrine needs to be able to convince the Soviets and convince them in peacetime without undergoing the horrible experience, catastrophic and unimaginable of nuclear war, needs to convince the Soviet leadership, political and military, that they cannot win a nuclear war, that it is quite likely one can't tell for sure, of course, uh, but very likely to escalate to uh, strikes against cities on, on both sides. Secretary Brown, we'll be back with more on this discussion in a moment. With us again now, Secretary Brown. Mr. Secretary, it seems that the genius of mutual assured destruction was that both sides had to believe that there could not be such a thing as a limited nuclear war, that a limited nuclear war would inevitably escalate into one that would just be unimaginable. Has that changed? I don't think that uh, uh, our views have changed on that. I think it very likely that a nuclear war would escalate all the way to mutual destruction. Uh, but the Soviets prize other things besides their cities and their industry. They prize their military power, they prize their political control and their military controls. They need to know that should a nuclear attack by them take place on us, uh, we would have, the president would have, options as to what would be struck. Well, you see, it's all very well to speculate on what a nuclear war would be like and to say the only way to stop a nuclear war <coughs> is for everyone 
to believe, as I believe, and I assume from what you say you believe, that it's likely to escalate all the way. But suppose an attack came, and it was not an all-out attack. Would we then say, well, our doctrine is that uh, this has to lead to a complete catastrophic exchange on both sides and respond that way? No, but the logic has always been, if I understand it correctly, Mr. Secretary, that unless you cause the other side to believe that you would respond that way, then the possibility of a nuclear exchange becomes somewhat enhanced. Anybody who thinks that a limited nuclear war is uh, anything less than a catastrophe is very, very foolish. All right, explain. What could a nuclear limited war be? How many people are we talking about in terms of deaths? It depends. You know, you, you ask for a... We're talking about hypothetical situations. Supposing that they struck 100 military targets. I think that that could very well be uh, 100,000 deaths. Uh, faced with that, should a president of the United States attack in a way to cause 100 million deaths? It's easy to say it's only if we say that that the other side will be deterred. But given those events, should a president react that way? Uh, I would not recommend that that be the only option, because under those circumstances, there'd be a very strong argument, no, don't do anything. Maybe we can stop it there. And all this game playing, all this uh, intellectual conceptualizing beforehand uh, can't really replicate what the actual situation would be. It would be unbelievably damaging. I think it would be very hard to restrain an escalation. But I don't think that we ought to say the only way to stop a nuclear war is to threaten something which, if the event came, would be an irrational response. Because the other side may just not believe us in that case. The important thing is to preserve a survivable, retaliatory nuclear capability and thus deter a nuclear war. That's what our weapons acquisition policies are aimed at. That is what our nuclear targeting policies are aimed at. Secretary Brown, thank you very much indeed. I, I only hope that you know as much as you seem to know. <laughs> I only hope that people in the United States, including all those who look at this problem, recognize the importance of deterring nuclear war and deterring it by having a broad variety of options and a survivable nuclear deterrent. That's our intention. That is our program. Dr. Brown, it was good of you to join us. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment.